Hi there, and welcome to Physically Debunked. On this channel, I typically analyse misinterpretations, misrepresentations, and misuses of modern science in relation to the big question, does God exist? Today, however, we'll be investigating an existence claim that is also riddled with misconceptions, but which may be a bit more answerable than the biggest questions of existence. At least I hope so. Perhaps this question will be just as difficult to answer as any other. In any case, our subject matter is much smaller than usual, as we'll be zooming in into the microscopic world and asking the question, do virtual particles exist? Now, the reason that I wanted to address this question is because virtual particles often crop up in arguments about whether you can get something from nothing. When somebody asserts that you can't get something from nothing, someone who's well-read in popular science books may well cry. Ah, in quantum field theory, virtual particles pop in and out of the vacuum all the time, which proves that you can get something from nothing. I've noticed in the popular science literature that this is essentially how virtual particles are described. If you read Stephen Hawking, he explains the phenomenon of Hawking radiation in terms of virtual particles popping into existence, and doesn't really lend an ear to arguments about whether these particles really exist or not. Even more extravagantly, Lawrence Krauss uses virtual particles as evidence for his hypothesis that the universe could have sprung into existence from nothing, like a quantum fluctuation. If you do a bit of digging on the internet, however, you'll find articles by physicists and philosophers of physics asserting that virtual particles don't really exist at all. They're just useful computational tools to make our calculations easier. To anyone who hasn't studied quantum field theory, which is basically everyone, it'll be very unclear who is right and who is wrong about whether virtual particles exist. I hope in this video to make some of the issues clear and to give you the facts that you need to decide whether virtual particles exist and whether they do the things that people say they do. To understand virtual particles, we need to do three things. First, we need to understand what virtual particles correspond to in quantum field theory. Secondly, we need to work out whether these virtual particles actually exist. And thirdly, we want to ask whether they do pop into existence from nothing. This is a lot to get through, and there'll be some tricky concepts along the way. So I wish myself luck in adequately explaining it all. Without further ado, let's jump in. First question, what are virtual particles? Virtual particles appear in our most fundamental, experimentally verified theory of the microscopic world which is known as quantum field theory. Quantum field theory is one of the most amazing intellectual achievements in all human history, describing the bizarre, counterintuitive microscopic world with astounding accuracy. It is the synthesis of special relativity and quantum mechanics, and it forms the foundation upon which the standard model of particle physics is built. In quantum field theory, the fundamental object is the quantum field, and for each different kind of particle, we have a different quantum field. What a particle is, is an excitation of the particular quantum field that it's associated with. This is definitely a difficult thing to visualise, so let's introduce an analogy that will be useful for the rest of the video. A quantum field is like a fluid filling all of space, and particles are like waves moving through this fluid. A particle like an electron is just a little vibration, a little wave in the electron quantum field, and as this wave moves through the quantum field, so the electron moves through space. The two main concepts we want to describe in quantum field theory are particles and forces. We've talked about what a particle is, so how about a force? A force is an interaction between different kinds of field, and the way that the force gets transmitted is by particles associated with that particular force. For example, the electromagnetic force is associated with the photon, a particle of light. Charged particles like electrons feel the electromagnetic force because electron fields and photon fields interact with each other. This probably seems very abstract at this point, so to make what's going on clearer, we're going to follow in the footsteps of good old Richard Feynman and draw some pretty stick diagrams. Let's take a fact which you should be familiar with from school, the fact that like charges repel. If we take two electrons, how can we explain that they repel each other in quantum field theory? To illustrate what's going on, we can draw a Feynman diagram. We represent the path that each particle takes through space as a line, and the points where these lines intersect is where interactions occur. In the Feynman diagram, we have two electrons travelling towards each other, represented by the two straight lines. 
as they get close to each other, they start to interact electromagnetically, which means that each electron is interacting with the photon field. To describe this interaction with the photon field, we draw a photon, a wiggly line, which is emitted from one electron and hits the other one, causing the two electrons to veer away from each other. The exchange of a photon represents the two electrons interacting electromagnetically, and the result is that the two get pushed away from each other, explaining the well-known fact that like charges repel. But hang on, where does this photon come from? Do electrons just randomly spit out photons? If so, doesn't this violate conservation of energy? The reply to all these good questions is that the photon that's exchanged isn't a real photon, it's a virtual photon. We've encountered our first virtual particle in the strange world of quantum field theory. To summarise what we've learnt from this, virtual particles can be seen as transmitting forces between actual particles. Instead of seeing electron repulsion as some spooky action at a distance, we instead realise that the electric force is just the exchange of a photon between two charged particles. Virtual particles also give us an intuitive explanation for why the repulsion between two particles is stronger when they're closer together. As particles get closer to one another, the number of virtual particles they exchange increases, which means more force is transmitted between the two particles. All in all, virtual particles are actually quite a nice explanatory feature of quantum field theory. It's at this point, however, that we start to wonder whether virtual particles actually exist in the world. Notice how we introduced virtual particles into this discussion. Virtual particles entered into our discussion because we drew a nice diagram to help us explain how quantum field theory worked. The question we need to ask now is whether these diagrams accurately represent what's going on, or whether they're merely useful visual aids for picturing quantum interactions. So, do Feynman diagrams actually tell us what's going on at the microscopic level? The answer to this is a resounding no. Feynman diagrams don't literally represent what's happening during an interaction at all. What they actually are, are clever diagrams that represent terms in a long mathematical sum. The main quantities we're interested in calculating in quantum field theory are called scattering amplitudes, which tell us the probability of different particle interactions occurring. To calculate the scattering amplitude, we need to compute and add together lots of horrible mathematical terms that strike fear into the heart of any physics student. Now, I'm sure I'm correct in saying that you would not want to calculate this, and you're not the only one. Physicists have no desire to calculate this complicated sum, so we use Feynman diagrams instead. Each term in this sum can be written as a Feynman diagram, and along with some rules for turning Feynman diagrams into numbers, the sum is much easier to evaluate. Because each Feynman diagram just represents a mathematical term in a sum, some physicists believe that virtual particles don't actually exist. When an interaction occurs, we have to add together an infinite number of different Feynman diagrams. This would imply that when electrons repel each other, it's not just as simple as exchanging a single virtual photon. The electrons are in a superposition of exchanging a single virtual photon, exchanging a photon that turns into an electron and a positron and then back into a photon as it travels, exchanging a photon that turns into eight different particle-antiparticle pairs as it travels along, and an infinite number of other things. It's wrong to say that forces involve the exchange of a single virtual particle and that's it. The number of virtual particles that actually get exchanged is undefined. So how can we say that virtual particles actually exist? This is known as the superposition argument and is one of the main arguments against the existence of virtual particles. It certainly seems to be a problem for the existence of virtual particles if our only reason to consider their existence comes from Feynman diagrams. If we were to compute scattering amplitudes without Feynman diagrams, would this mean that we eliminate virtual particles from our interpretation? The answer to this is also a resounding no. You see, whatever method we use to calculate scattering amplitudes, there are always terms of the computation that we can single out and interpret as describing virtual particles. In fact, this leads naturally to a definition of virtual particles, which means they can't be eliminated. Virtual particles are just those that only appear during the interaction and not in the initial or final state of the system. If we characterise them this way, any method of computing scattering amplitudes has these intermediate quantum states which we can call virtual particles. The existence and influence of virtual particles seems written into our theory. Perhaps the biggest reason why some physicists deny the existence of virtual particles 
is because we can never directly observe or detect them. Real particles can be detected in experiments and can exist for an infinite length of time if they're stable. On the other hand, virtual particles are restricted by a version of Heisenberg's uncertainty principle. What this says is that the universe can borrow energy to create the virtual particle, but the more energy that's borrowed, the less time it can be borrowed for. Virtual particles borrow energy, and so, by the uncertainty principle, they can only last for a very small length of time, which means they can't be detected as single particles. But does our inability to measure virtual particles negate their existence? Quarks, the particles that make up neutrons and protons, have never been detected as single particles, but that doesn't mean we think that quarks don't exist. This seems like a double standard. Why is it okay to accept that quarks exist when we've never detected an individual quark, but we have to deny the reality of virtual particles? We accept that quarks exist individually because it helps us explain proton and neutron structure. There are a multitude of phenomena in quantum field theory that would be very difficult to explain without virtual particles. The real, bare electric charge of an electron is different to the value which we actually observe, which we measure. This is explained in terms of a photon cloud of virtual photons surrounding the electron. The lamb shift is a difference between two energy levels in hydrogen that ought to have the same energy, but don't because these levels interact differently with virtual particles. The probing of proton structure is done using virtual photons. If we rely on virtual particles to explain all these phenomena, then surely we need to accept that virtual particles exist. There are some good arguments on both sides and you're free to interpret the facts how you want to, but I think the theory is suggesting something fairly clear. If we go back to our analogy of a quantum field is like a fluid spread out through space, then we can form a decent analogy of the difference between virtual particles and actual particles. A real particle is like a stable ocean wave. It can last for as long as it wants to, and it has real observable effects when it collides and interacts with other waves. A virtual particle, however, is like a tiny chaotic motion in the fluid. We can have lots of these little chaotic motions that slosh around, but don't travel very far because they dissipate quickly. A virtual particle is like this. It's like a little slosh in the fluid that doesn't generate a stable wave. The slosh only lasts for a little length of time, breaking down before it can travel very far. This means that we can't observe the sloshes because we're so far away from the interaction, but these sloshes do have a real effect on the stable waves, the actual particles that reach us and we detect. So that's how we can view virtual particles. They're little sloshes unstable ripples in the quantum field. Now that we've discussed what virtual particles are and whether they exist, we can now talk about whether they do the things that people claim they do. One worry people have about virtual particles is that they seem to imply that energy isn't conserved on the quantum scale. This is actually false. Total energy is always conserved, even on the level of virtual particles. When I said earlier that the universe borrows energy to create virtual particles, what I really meant is that the universe is borrowing a kind of energy that ordinarily it wouldn't have been able to. In classical mechanics, we have kinetic energy, which is associated with the positive energy that particles have. And we also have the potential energy, which is typically negative and associated with the forces between particles. In quantum field theory, however, forces are transmitted by virtual particles. So the total energy that a virtual particle has is the sum of its positive kinetic energy, which is the energy it borrowed, and the negative potential energy associated with the force. All in all, these two cancel out, meaning that energy conservation isn't actually violated. The main claim about virtual particles I want to analyse, however, is whether they are created from nothing, and whether they provide evidence that the universe could spring into existence from nothing like a quantum fluctuation. The important thing to realise here is that virtual particles don't just appear from nothing. We said earlier that virtual particles are like little sloshes in a quantum field that exists at all points in space. To appear from nothing would mean to come into existence from a state in which nothing existed, a state absent of all objects and properties. The quantum field, however, is not nothing. It obeys equations and is defined at every point in space, which implies that we need something, space-time, in order for the quantum field to exist at all. When people say that virtual particles pop out of the vacuum, what they mean is that the lowest energy state of the quantum field is constantly fluctuating and producing these sloshing virtual particles. This doesn't sound at all like virtual particles are coming into existence out of absolute nothing. A better way of putting it is that ripples are constantly forming and dissipating in a pre-existing fluid, the quantum field. To say that virtual particles are actually formed from nothing 
is quite incorrect. So I think we can comprehensively dispense with the idea that quantum field theory suggests that things are created from nothing all the time. Alternatively, while it's incorrect to say that virtual particles are created out of nothing, the existence of virtual particles suggests that some of our built-in intuitions about the world may well be wrong. Whenever we have a quantum field, the uncertainty principle means that this field can't sit still. In other words, if we have this quantum field filling all of space, it can't sit motionless for all eternity even if initially there's no movement in it. Little ripples, virtual particles will bubble in and out of existence. What this seems to suggest is not that something can come from nothing, but that transient structures and motion can appear from a lack of structure. We don't need anything in the quantum field initially, and we'll still get virtual particles teeming in it. What I think this suggests is that virtual particles can ask some challenging questions of our intuitions behind causation, and whether a lack of initial structure implies lack of structure for all eternity. These virtual particles don't seem to have a clear cause for their existence, and neither do they seem to require a prime mover for their formation. It seems undeniable that these quantum fluctuations are created in something, the quantum field, but much less clear that they're caused or formed by something. So while I completely disagree with the claim that virtual particles offer evidence that something can come from nothing, I do think that virtual particles offer significant challenges to our concepts of causation and our intuition that structures can't form in something initially structureless without outside influence. Whether this sheds any light on how our universe began is a fascinating question. Even if it doesn't show that our universe could be born as a quantum fluctuation, I'm sure that it will have important consequences for our understanding of the early universe. It also offers a warning that the universe may well not require a prime mover or outside influence for the structure that has formed within it. Thank you very much for watching. I hope you found this video interesting and not too difficult to wrap your head around. To summarize, do virtual particles exist? Probably. Do they show that something can come from nothing? No.